That's if kinda... I could, I would, um, I, I would say there would probably be more luck in getting that circulated through the independent U.S. media mm. than there would be through mainstream sources. Um, so that may be an option if you email it to people like the Jimmy Doors and the Fault Lines and the Ron Pauls of the world. Mm. Um, they may be more apt to pick it up and run with it than a mainstream media source would right now. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, which we are trying as well. <laughs> I would also so recommend, I, oh, uh, I would sorry. also recommend <laughs> reaching out to Mohammed El Mazi. Uh, mm. Right. He's right. Yeah, he so, covers. Yeah. He's does a brilliant um, And also Tara Kadad, because mm. I'm 99 percent sure that his new outlet, The Watchdog, would would mm. rent that for you. Yeah, he's brilliant too. In fact, uh, when we when the first letter went out, his article on it was by far the most comprehensive, um, and he went into a lot of depth. So it was um, yeah, it was a real loss when he left Newsweek because he he was doing a brilliant job there. Well, and that's but, you know, he's doing a great job now. He's doing a brilliant job now. Yeah. And that's Newsweek's loss for refusing to print accurate material. Mm, mm. Yes, because he exactly. had brought he had brought to them, you know, the the WikiLeaks drops on the OPCW report, and mm. said, "I would like to do a story about it," and they said, "No." Yeah, it's shocking, <laughs> isn't it? Absolutely <laughs> shocking. Yeah. Well, it shocked really? him. Like he went, yeah. Yeah, I came as a complete surprise, and he had a crisis of conscience over it, and debated whether or not to leave for a little while, and then said, "No, I have to do this. I can't be subjected to censorship in my chosen profession. I'll go mm. do my own thing." Yeah, well, I mean, in all power to him. That's fantastic. Good on him. But you know, that's a it's a sad though sort of snapshot of where the media is at, and one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that Julian Assange's case is so important, isn't it? Because, you know, that's where we're going. If you want to tell the truth, you have to leave the mainstream. You have to go into independent media. You have to go out on your own. It's, you know, increasingly becoming the only way it's possible to do that, isn't it? So um, it's great that he did that, but it's, it's, uh, it's very sort of relevant to Julian Assange's case that he had to do that. You know, here we have, we've got it, you know, the OPCW leak is evidence of being lied into war yet again and you know nobody will touch it it's really yeah really and, and not just lied to but but tricked into tricked it. yeah yeah crime scene staged yeah <laughs> scene. yeah that's right by and a trusted organization yeah no well reported on by a trusted organization sorry and no repercussions whatsoever for the people at the top of the opcw who were directed by the u.s state department to you know, have this conclusion and work backwards until they can kind of prove it. The the people who have gotten in trouble over it were the first two whistleblowers. Mm, mm, but yeah. Very, very, it, it mirrors uh, what happened with the collateral murder video. Nobody who shot unarmed civilians or shot children or shot Reuters journal, people who work for Reuters, faced a, a single charge, yet Chelsea Manning, spent 77 percent of her adult life locked up uh, at, at that point and julian remains illegally and arbitrarily incarcerated exactly yes um which is you know i mean even if julian assange isn't extradited and one of the things that the doctors are talking about and and you know trying to raise awareness of is that there's a another a second precedent being set right now which is that a publisher is being tortured before our eyes in plain sight with impunity for publishing factual information you know for helping people to understand that two children had their father slaughtered in front of them a reuters photojournalist was shot down for absolutely no reason um, we just, you know, all that Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning and Kristen Hrafson from WikiLeaks did was try to help people to understand what was going on and understand, um, you know, the, the significance of those deaths and tens of thousands of others. And so, um, you know, the, the chilling precedent, even if, even if the espionage, espionage Act is never used against Julian Assange, the fact that he's being subjected to this long, slow, cruel, vicious, you know, destruction by psychological torture and medical neglect is a really terrible precedent in itself. Um, and I know you guys were talking about that a little bit a couple of weeks ago about the self-censorship that's happening now and the fear that that's creating, now, even in independent media that's being censored if they talk about Julian Assange. Um, yeah, but, it, yeah, 
it is pervasive and it is unfortunate. Uh, and it's a, a symptom of the, I, of where we're at right now, not just in terms of like Western or U.S. society, but where journalism is. You you don't get anywhere. And I mean, traditionally, you don't get anywhere without playing ball. But now it's even more uh, stark than, than it has been um, basically since uh, the release of, of the DNC emails, the Podesta emails, Vault 7 and 8, uh, the way that, that journalists have responded to it to me is incredibly disheartening, um, particularly the the Press Freedom Foundation, the way they just hurled Julian under the bus. And, uh, and, and that was an organization that he helped create. And he helped create it to skirt around the persecution that WikiLeaks was facing in terms of people supporting. And now this organization is like, yeah, no, we never heard of them. <laughs> Yeah, it's shameful, isn't it? I mean, uh, there are, though, a lot of heavy-hitting human rights and press freedom and international law groups. You know, they're probably the, the biggest and, um, you know, most respected are in Julian Assange's corner. And that's another thing that's not reported. I think that's really, you know, that's, that's a big deal and it's underplayed. And, um, I mean, that's something that can help establishment types to get on board too, to know that, that you're actually not out on a limb. There's Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, of course, the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. There's also, you know, and Nils Meltzer, Rapporteur on Torture, but there's also the, um, the Council of Europe, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, International Bar Association, Human Rights Institute, International Observatory for Human Rights. You know, these are sort of really highly respected on the world stage and they're making very strong statements about not just saying, oh, look, you know, um, not even just talking about journalism being criminalised, but saying the extradition request must be denied, Julian Assange must be set free, this is a threat to human rights and press freedom. So it's a, it's a really quite a surreal situation where you've got the world's leading human rights and international law authorities saying, no, this has to stop. The media's not really reporting that, it's continuing. Um, you've got doctors, you've got international jurists, you've got how many journalists signed that letter? I mean, an enormous number of journalists signed an open letter course. So you've got, you know, the main professional bodies coming forward too and saying, look, we're, we're standing with these human rights and international law organisations, saying medically, legally, and in terms of press freedom, this is, this is a travesty of historic proportions, you know. In this test case where we're trying to redefine, well, the US government, with the help of the UK government, is trying to redefine journalism as espionage. Um, you know, and and the publisher at the heart of it is being treated inhumanely in this politicised landmark test case, you know, 